Well, 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 would you take a look at that? The sun, it slowly sets on day number 99 of our world. Lads, laddies, everybody, it's me, Minecraft's most handsome, and welcome to 100 days in Minecraft Hardcore Super Flat Survival. In today's video, we're gonna take a look, reminisce the story of how our world went from this flat world with literally nothing to this gigantic empire with the most beautiful builds in the world. I'm gonna do this video a little bit different than your typical 100 days video, so uh, let me know what you think about that down below. Leave a like for more of the series, subscribe if you're new. My name is Waddles, and let's go! Ah, day number one of our super flat world. I can't lie, on day number one, I was so nervous. I didn't really know what to expect inside of this world. I don't think I said it in the episode, but I was like, skeptical. Very skeptical as to how far we could actually take things inside of this world. Anyways, on day number one, I accomplished like essentially nothing. All I did is I went over to a village that was like right by world spawn and like tormented it, looted it, ravaged it, and tried to find everything of value that I can and extract it from this village. Now the super flat world that we've been playing our series in, it's your average super flat world, except it's exceedingly not. You're definitely not at all. We should rewind a little bit before day number one. Before day number one, I did some tricky version hopping to make sure this world would have more structures than it usually would. Inside of our super flat world, we've definitely got mine shafts, definitely got ruined portals, definitely have villages, and I think we have the stronghold too. I did mess up the world generation a little bit though, so we'll have to find that out later. Back to day number one, or should I say day numbers two through five. After I pretty much fully looted that village, I found a ruined portal right next door and decided that I needed to go to the nether on day number like one, or episode one at least. So I declared this ruined portal to be our base and on day number two, I set out to explore the rest of the world in search of lava. Now this exploration trip didn't last just one day because I found a lot of things. I just kept going and going and going. This exploration trip lasted, I would say, days like two through day number five. On this exploration trip, I found like a million and a half villages, specifically. Exactly. Of course, as any good explorer would do, I checked out these villages and left everything alone. Like, I didn't take a single thing at all, just looked at the villages, uh, winked at the villagers a little bit, and, you know, like, kept going or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Inside of this village, I came up with the really, really smart idea to take an iron golem out to, to of course, get a little bit of iron. And... As you might remember, or as you can maybe see here, it clearly, it clearly went exactly as planned. This was probably the closest I was ever to losing this entire world, and it was the first episode. <laughs> In shame, after that moment, I left that village, never to return again, kind of, in a way, and went over to a different village. Then, at that other village, I pulled it off right this time. I got a little bit of iron, then I went over to a ruined portal, found a little bit of lava, and said, Wow, that's great. Let me use the iron that I just got from this iron golem on a brand new bucket, grab the lava, and take it back home. Then I'll come back because I thought there was more lava. I dropped the lava off at home, got back over to the portal, and then realized there was no more lava. It was literally flowing lava that I didn't stick around and see. My dreams were crushed. We weren't going to make it to the nether on episode one, but we'll make that a goal. It's something we'll take on later on. To wrap up the very first episode of this series, I went over to an outpost that I actually found in this episode as well, kind of crazy, and rescued my best friend, sweet, sweet Maggie, my ally. And that wraps up everything that we did in episode number one. <laughs> it, it, it was kind of a big one. That moves us along to episode number two, and maybe the most productive, or ah, like the second most productive episode of this entire series. In this episode, I worked on an iron farm, and speaking of episodes, yeah, it's a little bit different. If you're new here, this is all brand new information, but if you know, you know. If you're not new here, you may remember this journey in even more vivid, lush detail, and yeah, that's because I've got a whole series for this thing. After you've finished watching the recap, or heck, I don't know, like maybe even right now, go ahead and check out the playlist that I'm linking on screen right here. It's the entire series, episode by episode, in even more detail. There might even be more episodes after this, but I guess it depends on you. I mean, you're the boss after all. Anyways, in episode number two, I worked on an iron farm. In theory, because I designed this entire iron farm, this should be pretty simple, but 
To be honest, it was actually a nightmare. You get in the villagers, not a problem. I source them from the villages that are around me. I'm living in the middle of two villages, and not a problem. Take one from over there, one from over there, boom, we're pretty much good. The real problem here was the zombie. I didn't own any name tags, you see, and that meant I was gonna need to find a zombie that could pick up an item, and that was annoying. That was really, really annoying. Because I couldn't find a zombie that would pick up an item, this took me from day number five all the way up to about day number 15 in this world. And it was kind of embarrassing. But nonetheless, eventually I was able to prevail. I found a zombie that would pick up a tool, put that zombie in the middle of the iron farm, and finish that beauty up. I ended up building the world's most beautiful and also most productive iron farm ever. I mean, look at this thing. It's great. After wrapping up day number 15, I decided it was time to hunker down, focus in, put our feet down to the ground, and get digging, and digging, and digging. And by digging, I actually mean like killing the ground, but it's kind of like digging, right? Like, if you think about it, you're digging off the first layer of the ground, so, uh, yeah. I got to digging, and digging, and digging. I decided I would try and build the, the world's, world's biggest, biggest wheat farm, farm and... Then I downscaled my ambitious goal to a still very ambitious four chunk total wheat farm. In the beginning of the game, with like only wooden stone tools, maybe a little bit of iron now, um, it was a big process. While working on this farm, I remembered that the slime that spawned constantly all over this world are going to trample the farm and it's really annoying. So I had to expand that simple wheat farm into a whole wheat farm with a big moat around it. And this moat, oh boy, this was annoying. It had to go all the way down to bedrock, which was, <laughs> I mean, it's a super flat world. It wasn't that bad. It was like three blocks and maybe like four blocks wide or something. Yeah, you know, no big deal. This wheat farming process was uh, big. This took a long time to set up, like way more time than it really realistically should have. This took me from day number 16 up to about day number 35. Yeah, uh, like 15 or, or 20 days spent literally just planting wheat and reharvesting wheat and planting until I could get this thing fully, uh, fully planted. But don't worry, don't worry. This farm, this will become a machine for us a little bit later on. Also, inside of this episode, we met our best and dearest friend ever. My, my literal best friend, Lily. And, and Lily has been with us ever since this fateful day. I had to fish a little bit for the fish, but that was no big deal because, of course, I remember all of the fishing mechanics and rules and great, great ways to get treasures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After getting Lily, I decided Lily would be the subject of my scientific experiment, where I basically uh, let Lily bring me prizes for free at nighttime, and then I put those prizes in a box to try and see what I can get. I can never remember what the cats could bring you. After working at the wheat farm for a long, long time, I decided I needed a break. So I took an adventure, a trip down memory lane, back to that first outpost. When I found that first outpost, all I did was rescue the LA. There is a loot chest at the top of that outpost and surely, definitely gonna be worth it. So I ran like 500 or more blocks to go over to this outpost, to climb the top of the outpost, to get disappointment. A deep and lonely feeling of disappointment and sadness, and, and that's it. But I flipped that around by going over to the local mine shaft that was right next to the structure and getting at least a little bit of loot. And you see, at least this stuff was good. I got a name tag too. Back over at the base with a brand new upgraded fully grown wheat farm, I decided it was time to get serious. This wheat farm that I spent so much time building was meant to establish two things. Food supremacy, like uh, a food supply constantly and I'm good, but also money. <laughs> sweet, sweet money and profits, but not quite yet. We're getting ahead of ourselves. You see, back over at the villages around our base, I realized the supply of villagers was running low. So it was time to build this world's first build, kind of, and also most romantic build. A villager breeder built out of the love wood block. A mangrove wood. Building this villager breeder yeah, actually wasn't bad. It didn't take very much time at all. Building this entire breeder, including relocating a couple more villagers from some local villages, took me about four in-game days. It wasn't bad. By the time I was done with this process, it was already day number 42. Almost halfway done. Also, while working on this breeder, I got to use my very first touch of spruce wood in this world, which was beautiful. A little bit earlier on, a wandering trader appeared, which is kind of my best friend in this world. I hate to say it and I bought a spruce sapling. I also made a very, very sad discovery about moss. Check out the episode for more if, if you want to know about that. 
with more villagers than I could ever dream of, now it was time for profit. Sweet, sweet profit. The romantic build, it looks right at our money making machine. Next step was to build a trading home, a small but simple thing for farmer villagers. You see, I have so much wheat, like way more than I could ever need. I wanted to put a couple farmer villagers inside of this thing and sell them all of my profits. But I also wanted to have something to use my money on. So I cooked up another farm that we could build in this episode and attach it to the trading home. This build had to look good though, so I spent a lot of time working on the build and making sure it looked good. Mangrove wood on the roof? Yeah, this is like the first build I've ever done that with and it's so good for a roof. Like, it looks so, it's so perfect. I think I'm in love with mangrove wood. As you would expect, of course, I fully finished the build front, back, and uh, top side, bottom side, you know, every single side fully finished, don't worry about it. And then I got some villagers inside of it. I got four specific farmer villagers, one trade took wheat from me and one trade well, I think the other trade took each of the crops, like carrots, potatoes, and beets. I added two more villagers to this trading hall with the intent of coal farming. You see, I can sell all of my precious wheat and get a lot of money. Then I can take that money, like literally right next door to these fishermen villagers and to buy from them like a million buckets of fish. <laughs> Whoops, leveled them up a little bit. Uh, but eventually I could buy campfires from them. I get the campfires, I break the campfire, and I get charcoal renewable fuel finally after working on this trading home there was an all-in-one wheat selling emerald collecting coal getting machine i was inspired i love the farm vibe you know so next up i decided i needed five more farms inside of this world to move things along the first farm that i declare essential to every single super flat experience is a simple bone meal machine you take all of the extra seeds from this wheat farm that at this point were starting to pile up and throw them inside of a composter. Compost it into bone meal and you can actually decorate this boring flat area. Or you could use that bone meal for farm number two, the beautiful pumpkin machine. This pumpkin farm, uh, it's literally just a couple pumpkins planted in the ground like pretty lame but I, I did use a bone meal to speed it up a little bit and I did decide that I would continue to expand this thing in almost every episode after this point. Flashback, rewind to the beginning of this video or the beginning of this series. When we spawned in this world, I did take note by world spawn of all the passive mobs over there. These mobs would be very, very crucial to our experience, including cows. Oh, sweet, sweet cows. It's been so long since I made a crusher and I'm, I'm happy. I, I'm so happy. I know I'm a monster and a bad person and all this stuff for that. But like I built a cow crusher and I put the cows inside of it and started breeding them up. Wouldn't get food today, but soon. Soon, I'll have enough cows for one of the best foods in the game, and soon, I'll have enough beds for netherite in the game. So, uh, yeah, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself with this. Uh, basically, I decided to build a sheep pen as well, because sheep were over at the world spawn, and there's no chance I want to actually lose these things. To wrap up our farming extravaganza of an episode on day number 68, I finished by building a couple iron golem traps around our world. You see, I was sick of, uh, mortified, uh, disgusted, repulsed, whatever word you want to say. I hate the slimes. They're disgusting. They, they constantly spawn everywhere. So I built a couple simple iron golem traps with some magma and some iron golems up in the air. The slimes get distracted by them and then taken out by the magma block. It's kind of perfect. This moves us all the way up to episode number seven now. We began on the nicest day possible of this world. In episode number seven, I worked on a couple more machines and our first actual build of the world, like a build that I use. But to enable all of this to happen, to make all this possible, one insanely OP wandering trader visit that happened in the farm episode at some point. The wandering trader came to me and sold me all of these things, or like basically all of these things, and <laughs> it's literally insane. The dripstone is so OP. I used this dripstone to build a lava farm and what I thought was going to be a pointed dripstone farm as well, you know, so I could get even more pointed dripstone and maybe make a giant lava machine. Then I realized the pointed dripstone needs to be placed on dripstone to actually grow and it wouldn't grow. I thought I was out of luck until I realized I could get a couple stone cutter villagers, stone masons, whatever, and actually be able to buy dripstone blocks from them. So I did that. I had decent luck and my second mason villager was actually able to sell me the dripstone block. I bought some of those and then fixed the farm up. Now I can grow pointed dripstone and get lava too. And oh boy, speaking of lava, I got a great use for that. But before I just put that lava to use, what I did go ahead and do is finally clean up the storage situation. 
You see, up until this point, storage was all over the ground in the world, under the open sky, and it was beautiful, moonlit even, but uh, it was also like, it was really poor. So I decided to build a build that was inspired by Stardew Valley, my recent love. I'm like obsessed with Stardew Valley right now. My farm is going great. Got all of those Iridium tools and everything like that. You know, kind of unlike this world. But uh, anyways, I built this simple storage barn that I ended up being pretty happy with. I was inspired by the trading hall and all of the blocks that I really didn't have. I think I made it work out pretty nice though. I think it looks good. With all of that lava in hand, on day number 85, I decided it was finally time to take on that goal that we set on day number two, or maybe even day number one of our survival world here. Go to the nether. Essentially, I speed ran um, a nether portal. It, it was pretty crazy. Only took me uh, 85 days or so, but anyways, I speed ran a nether portal, got inside of the nether, and instantly got bombed. Good thing I brought that flint and steel. After that shaky beginning though, it actually wasn't bad. I was able to explore the nearby nether and actually locate not only the nether waste biome that we spawned in, but the crimson forest, the warp forest, the basalt deltas biome. I found every single biome except the soul sand valley. Now when I set out into the nether in this first episode, I was desperately, desperately looking for another fortress and unfortunately I wasn't able to find that, but yeah, like I said, four other biomes, four out of five, I mean, that's not bad. The nether trip was insanely, insanely stressful because, I mean, I felt like I was underprepared for it, no diamond or anything like that, but overall, I mean, it did go pretty well. Rewind things just a little bit, though, to those few moments before I went into the nether, because right before I did that, I actually made some big upgrades to our block generator. The cobblestone generator, it became a cobblestone titan, all with the help of one cleverly placed mangrove root block. I also, unfortunately, noticed something sad that I would inform the population of in the next episode. One of my dearest friends, Sweet Maggie. Sweet Maggie is missing. Starting episode number nine, the most recent episode of the series, uh, up until this one, it was a race against the clock. You see, it was now day number 90. I had nine days left to build the final farm that I knew I needed to build inside of this world to get it set and ready to go for the future. A mob farm. Now, building this mob farm was actually, I mean, it actually wasn't that bad. I mean, I kind of kept running out of blocks, but yeah, not that bad. This hostile mob farm was going to get me tons of bones and arrows, rotten flesh, and gunpowder. But definitely not spider stuff, because spiders will clog this thing, and they're really annoying. After building this farm, I would also discover that bats were going to spawn in this thing too, so, <laughs> I mean, I guess that's cool too. Initially, when I set out to build this farm, I was ambitious. I thought I could easily build the three layers of nine platforms. So three times nine, that's 27. And yeah, 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 that'll be overpowered. I'll have so many mobs coming from this thing. It'll be great. However, while working on this thing, time kept going and going and going. I was running out. I needed to finish this before day number 100 or it was all over. I think if I maybe somehow like had the extra blocks beforehand, I totally wouldn't have been able to do that. But I did realize that uh, there are no caves in this world, so all of the mob spawns are concentrated here. Even with just 18 platforms instead of the originally planned 27, I'm pretty sure this farm would be good. So I went ahead and did that instead, finished up this build, and I literally finished this in the nick of time. I literally finished this as of this moment right here. And here we are. That brings us to day number 99, the, the very ending of it, actually. As the sun slowly sets on our world, I would like to say thank you all for watching this series. I hope you have enjoyed it so far. I'm not sure what the future holds. Will I continue it? Will I not? What do you want to see? Would you like to see this world make some more big moves all the way up to day number 200? After all, I'm pretty sure we've got a stronghold in this world and we've got the perfect setup to get full diamond tools and armor real soon here. Anyways, that's everything that I did inside of my hardcore super flat world from day one all the way up to day number 100. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you made it to the end of this video, you are literally my best friend and I, I appreciate you. I ask you one more final favor. If you haven't yet, leave a like. It really, really helps the videos out huge time with YouTube. And if you're new here, hi, welcome, subscribe. On the end card, or like right now, I'll go ahead and pop up the playlist to this series. If you liked the sounds of this 100 days recap, go ahead and go back and check out the entire series up until this point. I promise you, you will enjoy it. Anyways, thanks again, friends. It's been me, Waddles. I will see you all tomorrow. Super flat survival forever.
Goodbye.